I'm sorry that I'm late, and let me tell you why right off the bat. Because we just had a press conference that started at 1 o'clock, but it went a little longer. Because we were calling for the, uh, the War Crimes Tribunal to indict Milosevic for war crimes. And we believe the record is clear, uh, that we can document the atrocities, and that if the War Crimes Tribunal exists for any reason, it would be to indict, in, to indict someone like Milosevic. Uh, we think that, uh, that if there's any peace uh, no settlement that is negotiated uh, should not ignore the fact that he is, uh, uh, has an indictment against him. Well, we've been planning this for a few days, and we found out this morning that the crimes the war crimes tribunal said that in a few days they might uh, indict Milosevic. So this is breaking right now. The reason I'm important to it, or I think I am, <laughs> is that on my committee on appropriations, I'm the senior Democrat on something called the Foreign Operations Committee. And our committee provides the funding for the uh, War Crimes Tribunal, and we put in a, a, a great deal of money, up to $13 million, for the War Crimes Tribunal, as well as another $10 million to, uh, to help uh, document uh, what has happened to the people get, when the refugees are coming right out of, of uh, Kosovo. One of the things that Milosevic is doing, in addition to the rape and murders and expulsions and ethnic cleansing and all that, is something called identity cleansing. If you leave, they force you to leave the country, but they make you leave your, tear up your passport, your driver's license, your any identity. And then they will destroy the records inside of Kosovo, so you can't even prove who you are or where you're from, which makes it much more difficult to go back, to repatriate, to identify who you are or to get any passage to another country because you simply don't exist. So this identity crisis on top of everything else is a real act of cruelty. And so some of this funding will go also to immediately help people um, um, get some form of documentation so that they can exist uh, and families can be reunited and people can uh, hook up again because many families have been split when we need there. So that's what's happening. Um, at the moment here, uh, and I thought you would be interested. But as always, the best laid plans of the schedule around here are disrupted oh, yeah. by votes or committee activities or whatever. Today it happened to be that issue. And as you know, Congress spends a good deal of time uh, on the Kosovo issue. The other issue this week is, gun, is the gun issue. And I don't think we'll have any, we were hoping to have some votes on it today or, or tomorrow, but um, it appears that the Republican majority has decided to put it off until after the holiday. We've been trying to force the vote uh, to, um, to have uh, some provisions that would call for registration of the guns, even if you buy them at a, a fair. And if you buy guns at a gun fair, you don't have to have registration and a waiting period. It doesn't apply the way you buy them at a store and raising the limit to 21 years old and you know, a series of, of changes like that. What else? The Cox report came out today, yes, yesterday about the espionage and that's a hot issue, so I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have on any of those subjects or any other subject. But I just want you to know that um, when word comes by, it's a big, it's, we're very complimented because I know you see everybody in Washington, D.C., so it's an honor for me that you're coming by. Also, I'm delighted always to see young people in Washington because this should be a place that all young people look to because so many important decisions are made here that affect your daily lives. And the, um, the air you breathe, the water you drink, your education, your access to health care, the environment in which you live, the economic security of the families in which you live, and uh, our world at peace. And, uh, it's, and, the, and it's all about the future, which belongs to you. The most inevitable of all things is that it is yours, and others will move aside and you will take over. Uh, but how you do that uh, 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 is affected by how the decisions are, what the decisions are that we make now. So I'm always delighted when young people are interested in coming here, even if it's just to see the sights, but maybe get a little feel uh, for, um, for what is happening in Washington, D.C. And if you have even more of an interest than that, I hope you will also sustain that because uh, uh, hopefully some of you will run for office, others you will support people who run for office, but all of you will always take an interest. Uh, in the issues so important to our country and to uh, the communities and into the personal lives of, of every person in there. So thank you very much.
uh, for coming, and I'd be happy to take any questions. This is, this is practically an exit interview. We've been here for 10 days. Yeah, I see. Yeah. That's a long um, visit. They've done quite a few interviews uh, over in the White House and, yeah. and the Vice President's great. office. And Wonderful. We saw Sandra Day O'Connor and, How and nice. Einstein. That's so, exciting. So, and the issues, of course, are always here, and it's the next one, the next yes, one, the next one. Exciting. So a lot of the questions that we're trying to drive really try to get to the underneath part, the values and the meaning, and, and George is standing by. Uh, so all this, you didn't hear any of it, huh? No, oh, we, we did. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're in the process of making a documentary of our interviews and you. our experiences with the hopes that we can share them with other students that don't have the same privilege that we do to get as complimentary as you are about, about uh, us coming by to see you. We know how crowded your schedule is. So. Excuse me, just one second. Uh, you can... Um, skip this. Or should we skip this? Or do you want uh, to do that? No, I would just wipe that out. Uh, the two, just just that. Yeah, wipe it out and just put Frank Bruni or okay. something. So you have spoken with him. Yeah. Okay. And then thank I'll you. Send all of that yeah, yeah. Me. Thank you. <laughs> if you want to just get out the the Cox Committee report statement first and then deal with the other thing, that's okay. good because that's all what right, he I'll needs. Right thank now. you. I'm sorry. It never stops around here. Everybody, <laughs> everybody else is waiting for answers so well, they can move ahead example. with their work. Yeah. We know, <laughs> and we forgive know the me. privilege that we're getting, <laughs> so hopefully we can take advantage of it. So, what questions do you have? <laughs> I have a question. Ms. Smith. In our interview with Congressman John Lewis, he described being lifted by the spirit or the winds of history because he had put himself in its path. Justice O'Connor told us that you can't predict what might come, but to prepare diligently so that you can take full advantage of the opportunities that will inevitably present themselves. What did you do to prepare for the incredible opportunity of being a member of Congress? Well, that's, uh, well, first let me say uh, what nice company to be in in a question. And secondly, that um, the tradition that I come from is that every person, uh, that every generation of Americans has a responsibility to the next generation of Americans, and that each one of us has a responsibility within that generation for what happens for the next generation. So that um, we come here not with a personal agenda, but with a, a responsibility uh, about the future, and I was born into a political family, and my, um, uh, with, which was always with the perspective that public service was a very high calling, and that um, it was an honor to serve. It was an honor to serve the people, and that we don't take the honor lightly, but very responsibly. I won't say anything as poetic as John. He is our. our, our uh, a preacher man, uh, but I, I do, um, I, I do uh, understand what he's saying about that. My generation was inspired by President John F. Kennedy. Uh, in, in his short, only three-year presidency, uh, he was a short, a short time in office, but left a long-time legacy of inspiration to people that, uh, uh, that serving the public was a good thing and that we all had a responsibility for it. Does anyone else have a question? Uh, in a recent speech, Senator Feinstein said that global warming is the single greatest environmental threat facing our planet. She also said global warming is real, it is happening, and it will have significant impact on human health, our environment, and our economy. Given the disbelief of outright opposition and international complexity surrounding this issue, can our world governments move quickly enough to prevent the most serious consequences of global warming? That's a really excellent question. Yes, the world governments can, but the question is, will they? I had the privilege of representing the Congress of the United States at the Rio, the Earth Summit in Rio, five, uh, now that's in 1992, already seven years ago. Vice President Al Gore, who is a leader on these international environmental issues, was there as Senator Al Gore. A few months later, he would be named the vice presidential nominee, and at that time, we talked very optimistically about um, the international global issues, including global warming. Five years later, there was a five year after uh, Rio, and there was an evaluation that said that we were not making nearly the progress we needed to make. And the conference in Kyoto, which is now the Kyoto Agreement that 
that we talk about on global warming uh, is very resisted even here in the Congress of the United States. And any bills that come up on the environment in Congress it almost always will say no funds in this bill which shall be used to implement the Kyoto Treaty. So uh, there's a strong resistance by many, even in our own country, as enlightened as we like to think we are, about, um, uh, about ending the global warming. And of course, as you, as you suggested in your question, a real challenge to the science. In my view, it is indisputable and that, uh, that w we will pay a large price if we don't invest the small amount that it would take uh, to implement the Kyoto Treaty. The Kyoto Treaty has not even been rat on global warming, has not even been ratified by the U.S. Senate. If I might just enlarge on that for a second, um, one of the, yesterday I had my office sponsored an all-day symposium on something called economic, uh, excuse me, it's called environmental justice now. And we had people come from all over the country. We probably had 30 witnesses to, and, uh, of, of grassroots people, of regulators, of, of people from all walks of life talking about the, how the environment affects their individual areas, how putting in a, uh, uh, some kind of a factory or, uh, and how toxic waste left over from previous uh, armed military bases and the rest affect the health and well-being of children in those communities. I wish I had here to show you, maybe at the end I, will, I still have one, but I was giving them away yesterday, a little doll called Wasted Babies, about babies whose health has deteriorated. Some of them have died because they le live near some of these places that pollute the air and, and um, harm the water supply. So in addition to the global warming issue, which is a very significant one and one that we cannot avoid, we ought that think globally, but we must act locally in order to um, uh, do what is right by the, uh, our children as far as the environment is concerned. Children, because of their development, are more impacted by toxic waste sites and things of that kind uh, than um, adults, even though adults are affected by it as well. Any other question? Andrew, you had a follow-up about that, that thing's pertinent. Issue. Um, yeah, I did. Um, what do you think it will take to cause us as a, as a society to begin to consume less, especially since other countries point to our level of consumption as a reason for not pursuing more environmentally sound policies? Yeah. Well, I think that it has. To, it's a very personal decision. I have long said that we must start educating our children at home when they're toddlers even, and certainly as soon as they go to school, about every person's individual responsibility uh, to the environment. And that means less consumption. And uh, that would make a big difference. Of course, as a society, we have to stop placing such a value on um, the indispensable. You know, it was, everybody has to have so many things and they're obsolete pretty soon and then you need something new in that vein. When I was at the Earth Summit and when I've been at other international conferences and I've spoken to women's groups, for example, at those forums, uh, and we talk about uh, world population being a major environmental issue, they are quick to say back to us, don't blame the world's uh, environmental issues on the fertility rate in the third world until you reduce the consumption rate in the United States mm -hmm. of America. Of course, we must do both. We must just, even if it weren't an environmental issue, just to lift up uh, the world's families and, and especially the world's women, uh, we must be able to put out information so that women can control the timing and the size of their families uh, so that women can receive more education and the, raising the literacy rate raises the uh, mortality, uh, the um, uh, survival rate of children and also the education rate and the income level of families. Uh, so reducing the number of children that families have in the third world uh, is uh, an important part of their well-being and it has a benefit in terms of stopping uh, the, the, the population growth. Uh, when we take good care of those babies that are born so that they don't die, so up until now families would have seven children so they'd end up with three or four, and if we increase the um, likelihood that the children will survive, 
uh, that survival rate will impact on a lower uh, birth rate in those places too. But we have to, I think that our country is very ripe for uh, some very serious conservation measures. We have not tapped the appetite in this country for conservation, by that I mean personal conservation as well as conservation of our beautiful natural resources, but also um, of uh, how we conserve uh, what we use in our, in our daily lives, I, and, and also uh, our energy usage, which is an important um, source of, of consumption, not source of consumption, but um, means of consumption. So we have a long way to go. I think it's going to require leadership at the highest level, but personal changes in personal behavior are right down the line. And again, Young people think differently about this. That's why I have hope, because young people understand these issues more clearly than people who were raised in another generation are set in different ways. I have hope about young people, not only about conservation, but about relationships among people uh, and uh, removing old biases and prejudices and the rest, thinking differently. Of course, being from California, I always say around here, it's in the water for us to think in an entrepreneurial way. We think differently about education, the, uh, our approach to the economy, how we deal with uh, addressing the challenges of the environment, equal rights and everything. Everything is fresh and new. Uh, no idea is ruled out just because it's never been tried before. And we certainly are not wedded uh, to old assumptions. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, Last week we talked to Justice O'Connor. Yes, that must have been quite a thrill. It was. And uh, we asked her about a statement she made in which she said, to, f to fulfill our obligations as citizens, to understand and uphold our Constitution, we must have educational institutions which foster the acceptance of the individual responsibility of citizenship. Do you think there's enough awareness among Americans today about the responsibilities of citizenship? I would like to hope, I'd like to think so. Uh, if you visited the Jefferson Memorial when you were here, uh, in the course of your trip, or I hope you will at some point, votes, sorry, then uh, you would have seen that, of course, he is, uh, Jefferson is one of my heroes because he believed that, uh, that all people were um, created equal and that, that uh, should, they should all participate in the political process. But fundamental to that, was universal education, universal education. So when we talk about a democracy, we also must have a dual track on that, which is an informed electorate, and that people won't have the full opportunity economically, politically, socially, culturally, unless they have the same kind of access uh, to uh, education. So, uh, so we have a responsibility as a country to make access to quality education accessible. Each individual certainly has responsibility uh, beyond that. And uh, I think it's different in different families, in different school areas and the rest. And it shouldn't really be between the federal government and the individual, but should come up in stages, but be reinforced uh, across the board. Because uh, freedom is, carries with it responsibilities. It definitely does. Uh, I'd like to see more. I've, I've even talked about lowering the voting age to 16 because I see young people in high school more interested in civics and history than when it's a requirement than when they go off to college and it's an elective and they may not even be in, enrolled in those courses. And I keep saying, that's the, those are the students that come to Washington. They're interested in the ideas. Maybe if we snag them at age 16, then we might hold them because the drop-off in voting is really appalling uh, in our country. And it's not the fault of young people, it's the fault of how we, as those with a responsibility for this, are not able to uh, have enough vision or show that we can make enough difference that we attract people to the polls so that they know that their votes uh, will count. I probably only have time for one or two more questions because this means we have a series of votes. So I'm going to have to run over there to, uh, to vote now. Okay. Any other question? Drawing on your life experience, what is the most important piece of advice you can give our generation? Right now, I mean, it might be two days from now, I might have other advice because I might be thinking in a different way. 
But right now, I think uh, what I would say to you is, know thy power. You have the power to make anything happen. You have the uh, energy, the imagination, you have the um, numbers, and, and the future is yours. So understand that all you have to do is decide on what amount of responsibility for the future you want to take. And understand that if you invest in that, you will absolutely positively make a difference. And don't wait until you're 20 years older to decide to do that. Start building uh, for it now or uh, thinking about it now and, and make a plan for it later. Uh, but I would say know thy power. And I always say to people, when you want, in anything that you do, have a dream, acquire knowledge, make a plan. And if you, have, if you do that, your enthusiasm for your dream will attract others to it to help you fulfill it. But you have to be clear about what your, your dream is or your vision, whatever you want to call it. Have a dream and a plan. And that plan has to be fundamentally buoyed up by knowledge. So I always put that step in there between. And if you're interested in politics, if you have a dream, a vision, a, a, the knowledge, you can demonstrate the knowledge, you have a plan on how you would do things differently, then you will attract support and then you will be successful. But I honestly believe people can do whatever they set out to do. Uh, but imagine, imagine different things. Ima don't be tied, uh, don't be tied to the past, except in terms of our values and our traditions, in terms of what, uh, what our country, what makes our country great, and that really is the fundamental belief of the dignity and worth uh, of every person in our country. We certainly value that. And I think more and more the electorate would be attracted to voting if they thought that the process and the debate was more values-based than just a pragmatic way uh, to win elective office. But for yourselves, be imaginative. Dream, plan, and uh, it, you will succeed. I'm certain of it. What do you think the The 10 minutes to vote, this one is followed by three, five minutes. Okay, I'll okay, be right there. I'll be right there. I have to run over. So. What do you think the biggest, very biggest challenges to our democracy are in, 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 at this particular point in time? Again, it, it, as I say, sometimes an answer might be one way. Not, not that one thing is more important than another, or that I would always say, know thy power, use thy imagination, and all that. But moving on to this, today what I'm going to say to you on this is, and I believe this, there may be other things, and I might accept that if I were having a debate about it, but I believe that the biggest threat to our democracy is um, we, we take an oath of office here. When we, and every person who serves in government takes an office, an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States and to, to protect and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I believe the biggest threat to our democracy is the role of campaign money in elections and in Washington, D.C because it does more to undermine, corrode the process. And it does more to alienate the public so that they think, why should I vote? They're just going to do what the moneyed interest want anyway. So I think that when we talk about a democracy, we talk about a rule of law and a, a, a majority view of the public. And if a majority of the people are staying home and not voting and don't have confidence in the system, that seriously uh, corrodes our democracy. I think that uh, as a country internationally, as long as we continue to be values-based, as we promote our country based on values, we will always be strong. I think that the fact that we are a country of immigrants and we constantly, over and over again, are reinvigorated by a fresh supply of new people coming into our society, that that is a, makes us special and different from every other country in the world this constant reinvigoration of people of courage and determination to leave their homes and come to another place to start a new life, to seek the American dream. In, many, in most cases, reinforcing our family values, our work ethic, our academic ethic, our sense of community, a sense of hope, and of, most of all that courage and optimism. I think that we constantly are, re are fortified and reinvigorated by that. So I'm optimistic about the people in our country, I'm optimistic about the values on which we were founded. I think the intervention is the role of money. 
and we call upon our colleagues here day in and day out to institute real campaign finance reform before we get beyond the point of, uh, of, of having our system seriously undermined by it. And I know that's not very good news, but it is uh, what I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, another day I might say if some other um, horrible thing loomed large on the horizon that that might be a threat to our democracy. But right now I think the strength of our democracy is our people and our strong hand. And we can withstand almost anything except the corroding of our, of our own uh, strength in that regard. Mm -hmm. Well, in any case, I, uh, I thank you all very much for your interest. I can tell by your questions that uh, this is a very special group indeed, and that uh, I also say to people when I hear questions of this kind how patriotic you are. You care about everything that is good about our country, and that includes our people, the, the environment in which we live, our natural patrimony that we have been bestowed on, uh, upon us. And um, it's, it's to be patriotic is to, to support our democratic freedoms, is to protect our natural resources, which are a part of our legacy, and uh, to, uh, to also uh, that freedom extends that I talked about to our expression in the arts and imagination and creativity and freshness and newness. And that's, I think, what America is about. And uh, that's what I think you all are about. So I commend you for that. And I thank you so much. I'm very inspired by your questions. And it's an honor uh, to be with you. Thank you again, Lord. Thank you, thank you very much. I see. Thank you. My pleasure. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Oh, that's great. Thanks very much. <laughs> I needed it. I was having a very bad hair day. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I'm sorry that I didn't have to hold down the door to go home. But it's wonderful to see you all. Thank you very much. I hope you're seeing you back in California now. Don't be strangers. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Now, how do you gentlemen feel being in the minority? This is how it is to be in Congress. For the women. So far. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.